Climate change is the defining issue of our time. I only came to this realization a little late after I retired from a long career in finance. But as I studied it and talked to a lot of people, it became so obvious what a horrific legacy, especially my generation, is leaving the world. So I was lucky to find Greenpeace, that large, global, inspiring organization. And I was proud and humbled at the same time to be their chief operating officer. And through them, I learned to try to live with the idea that the planet is not something we inherited from earlier generations, from our forefathers, but the planet is something we are borrowing from our children, our grandchildren, and indeed from all generations. So let's look a little bit at this beautiful planet of ours. The North Pole is the last pristine frontier of the world. And as you know, we're melting it. And while it is melting, all the nations around it are busily negotiating how to divide the borders so that we can exploit it more as it melts more. Did you know that the rainforests in Brazil or Indonesia together account for about 20% of climate change when you look at the deforestation that is happening there? And it's ongoing, it's still happening. No one can wax as well about the dangers to our oceans as the incomparable people that we just heard earlier. But the oceans are also heating up, they are acidifying, our reefs are being destroyed. Many of you might not have seen something like this before. This is just a tiny piece of the tar sands in the northwest of Canada. I call it Mordor. <laughs> this is the largest industrial project in the world. It alone is responsible for a significant part of CO2. It has the size of a small country when it comes to CO2. It alone is on its way of making Canada the third largest oil exporter in the world, of a very dirty oil, by the way, joining Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. And facing all this newfound wealth, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. The politics have shifted, and Canada has rescinded its prior agreement to the Kyoto Protocols, and Canada's CO2 footprint is increasing as opposed to most Western countries where it is decreasing. And we here in the United States are still blowing the mountaintops off of hills in Appalachia, West Virginia. Huge bulldozers are pushing the debris onto the populations below with disastrous consequences all in our search and our addiction for coal, our dirtiest fuel. And we keep those coal plants burning, although some of them are decreasing, thank God. And we keep our addiction to fossil fuels going, even while we know that renewables are on the increase and are possible. Remember the canary. When the canary would die, the miner surely would get out fast. Well, our canaries today are a little larger. The polar bear, because its habitat is being destroyed. Our canary is the orangutan in Indonesia, hanging on for dear life to the last tree, because its habitat is destroyed. Do you think we heed the advice of these canaries? No. We go farther up to the Arctic. We go deeper. And really, we know that we don't know what we're doing. We all hear. In the Northeast, remember the storm, Sandy. Devastating result. And no, it was not a once in a hundred year storm. It is a part of a pattern of volatile weather to come, storms, floods, drought. And it won't be a hundred years before the next one comes, and we know it. We know that we may lose our houses. We know here in Rhode Island, as we've seen here tonight, that we may lose our beaches or are likely to lose our beaches. We know that. Look at the droughts in California right now. We're going to lose the odd harvest. But while we may lose those things, it is, as always, the poorest of the world who will lose everything. Experts around the world are predicting that some 200 million people from the poorest countries in the world will face mass migrations and starvations. That makes 
Climate change is not just an environmental issue anymore. It is a moral issue. It is a human rights issue. It's, of course, also a development issue. And to show that it's not only us environmentalists that think about this, this is Mike Mullen when he was the chair of the chief of staff of the United States Armed Forces. A few years ago, he wrote a missive to all his commanders in the field about climate change. And I'm using his words when I quote, arable land is reducing, coastlines are receding, food is getting more expensive, mass migrations will occur. And as a result, more failed states. We will see more failed states in the world, and we will see radicalization of the regimes that step into the vacuum. All of us that read newspapers hardly need to be reminded today what that means. So you'd think, in all of this, we'd be doing something. And of course, there are good news as well. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what governments, then businesses, and then what we as individuals are supposed to be doing and what we are doing. When we talk about governments, I like to think about Denmark and Germany as good examples. Little Denmark now is deriving 30% of its energy from renewable resources into its grid. And it's well underway, according to most experts, to reach 0%, zero carbon society in 2050, which is the idea. Germany, a much larger economy, is not far behind. Germany is at 25%. There's a term in Germany called Energiewende, and it means energy transformation. Over there, it is not a term of the left or of the right. It is a term that has massive public support. It is a national priority. And on that basis, new laws and rules and regulations and policies are being implemented. And those policies are needed in this country far more and more ambitious than we actually have today. And these policies are in the obvious categories. They are policies to improve the use and, and increase the use of uh, renewables. There are policies to increase conservation, obviously. There are policies to avoid new coal plants for opening and indeed to, to phase out all coal plants. The easy one, there are policies to simply stop the direct subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. We are still subsidizing the fossil fuel industry with tens of billions of dollars a year and that doesn't even count the cost of remediation and the cost of our society down the road. Importantly, policies to improve our grid so that the whole new energy industry that we're facing in the future, which will be distributed, which is bottoms up, can use the new grid to live, deliver it from millions of points to our homes. And in the meantime, governments are negotiating. Later on this year, there will be the next round of climate negotiations in Paris. There have been a number of these rounds before. Of course, the climate itself, unlike us, doesn't recognize borders. But we do, so we have to negotiate. Let's hope that our negotiators this time will be far more ambitious, because they need to be than in the past. And let's hope that they won't act the way they have been acting so far, which is that they forget that the, that the planet does not negotiate. The planet moves on with us or without us. Businesses, of course, have a massive role to play in the transformation that is coming. I'm so glad to see that here in Little Rhode Island, we'll be the first one to host a major offshore wind farm in the country. Now, yes. And it's even better to know that this is the first one, supposed to be the first one, of a range of these things that will together account for about 45,000 jobs, 45,000 jobs in this region in the next 15 years, and that will serve 700,000 homes. Finally, we're doing it. They exist all over the world in many parts already, and for us it's the first, but we're catching up better late than ever, I should say. So business, of course, has a major role to play. A multi-trillion dollar transformation is not only needed, but it's already starting to begin in the business world as we see it. Businesses can do it. Engineers and scientists in many places are showing businessmen such as me the way to do it. It means use of renewables, better use of uh, and conservation and new energy efficiency technologies, and those are the two pillars. But if you look around you, those are being delivered in new business models that we see in the distributed environment all around us, energy innovation that's happening all around us. Don't forget, in many of these technologies today about climate change, we are kind of where the T-Ford was, you know, when cars were developed. There is massive opportunity there. 
it can happen. There is a brilliant man called Amory Lovins, who gives a great speech, a TEDx speech, if you ever have any interest, which he appropriately calls reinventing fire. And reinventing, in reinventing fire, he shows how this can actually be achieved. And I urge you to take a look at that. And he tells you that, and I agree with it, a multi-trillion dollar transformation is underway. It is underway in many ways. And there are some points of lights here, of course. Solar is one of them. Did you know that in the solar uh, industry, 36% of the new energy trans that was generated in the United States last year, 36% came from solar. One in eight jobs in this country that is new in the, in the, in the economy comes from solar. So only solar, and that's just one part of the whole environmental challenge and in industry, has 200,000 people employed right now. It's growing in a clip of 15 to 20 percent. As a comparison, the entire coal industry that has been so heavily defended has about 200,000 employees, if you count everybody involved in it, if you're generous about it. Countries that you might not expect, Mexico, Chile, Spain, Israel, have now achieved what we call grid parity. It means that the cost of delivering energy, renewable energy, to the homes of individuals is at par with the cost of delivering fossil fuel-based energy. Such are the progress that is being made today. Much, much more has to happen, but business people around the world are seeing this as a multi-trillion dollar transformation opportunity. Those conservative people that argue that the world cannot afford the transformation that we need really have to get their head examined because the opportunity is there and not doing it. Other than that, as a businessman, I see this as a major profit motive, but the opportunity is there not doing it. We cannot afford not to do it, and there's massive opportunity in it. Here, in the Northeast, we may remember that we were once the Saudi Arabia of the world, or what will be Canada of the world, I guess. We once were the energy center of the world because of the whaling industry. An entire economy in this part of the country was depending on the whaling industry because that was the major source of energy, and it's gone. It is gone because as much as I love to credit my good friends at Greenpeace with saving the whales, what really saved the whales was that the whalers ran out of customers before they ran out of whales because at that time a new technology, kerosene, was invented. Now we have renewables and a series of other things that are going to transform our society. So it is clear on the trajectory where we are that the fossil fuel industry as we know it will and must disappear. It is our job to help it along a bit by all various things that we can do. So why isn't it happening faster? Well, <laughs> to speak with Pogo, we have met the enemy and he is us. It is us as individuals who are not acting far enough and fast enough, and as a result, our politicians aren't acting far enough and fast enough. We're lucky here in Rhode Island that we happen to have our two senators who are amongst leading voices in the Senate in climate change, but we know that that's not the case elsewhere because the powers that are arrayed against change, powers that are arranged against protect, uh, for protecting the energy, the embedded energy interests are huge. I hate to say it, but I do agree with those who say that since the Citizens United ruling by the Supreme Court, we do indeed, when it comes to climate change, have the best democracy that money can buy. So who's going to do something about it? <laughs> Observe our politicians. Who's going to attack the fossil fuel industry? Who's going to attack the utilities? Who's going to change the coal industry? Well, not these monkeys. <laughs> it's unbelievable. 70% of Republican senators today, 70% say that they don't believe in climate change or that it is not man-made. Against the obvious evidence of 97% of all the global scientists, the climate scientists in the world, who are not only saying it, but who are proving it. So what do we do? Unlike my friends at Greenpeace, we don't all have to do dangerous things and get into fast boats up to the North Pole and risk our lives and risk jail time by fighting, in this case, the lunacy of developing oil in the North Pole. No, we have to heed the advice that we see here. The future of the planet is in our hands. It is us. 
It is up to us. And there are so many small things that we can do individually, that we can do ourselves in order to make a difference. Don't ever think that if you do something small, it doesn't matter. We need billions of acts of courage, acts of change, because especially if our politicians aren't doing it, it's got to come from us. And the, some of the things are simple, and most of them don't cost any money. We can drive a smaller car, it's cheaper. Buy a hybrid car. We can insulate our homes, it's cheaper. Better yet, we can put solar panels on it, and it's also going to save us money. We can turn that heat down. It's okay to wear a sweater in the winter once in a while inside the home. We cannot use the air conditioning. As we saw here this evening, we can buy sustainable local food. We don't need something on our plates every night that comes from across the world and causes a lot of CO2. We can eat less meat, especially we can eat less beef because beef has a huge CO2 footprint. And if you're my generation and you're starting to have to live off of your 401ks and your IRAs and, and these kinds of uh, interesting acronyms, you can look at what's in them. Why would I finance my retirement future in fossil fuel companies? Not only because we know they're going to go the way of whaling, but also morally, why would I? There are so many alternatives available that many of you can look at as well. And if you have to fly an airplane, you can buy offsets. Offsets themselves are easily purchasable. There are a number of good outfits that do it. And while they don't solve anything in and of themselves, at least they mitigate the impact of what you do. And these are only a few things. We've seen in other presentations tonight other things that people can do. But in addition to those few things that we can do, and they all matter. We also have to speak out. Because I agree with the Reverend Martin Luther King. There comes a time that silence is betrayal. And that time is now. I believe we have to speak out with our conscience, with our voices, with our wallets, and with our votes. And yes, of course, we've got to vote those monkeys out of office. There is a groundswell building of climate change activists, of people like me, like hopefully many of you that care. 400,000 people were last year on Central Park West protesting climate change. And that is growing from communities, from all stripes and all parts of society. I'm so encouraged, even though I'm not myself a believing man, that Pope Francis is making climate change, one of the main pillars of his papacy. We need those billion Catholics to be convinced, and other communities around the world. And I believe it is building. And why it is building? It is building because, as we hear today about the massive impacts of climate change, it is building because we have to act and save our planet. Imagine that we had a time machine, and this time machine could project us generations. And we were to step back and, and look at this planet. How would we want to be seen? Would we want to be seen as the locusts who in about 10 generations since the Industrial Revolution devoured everything that had the planet taken millions of years to create in order to make ourselves extinct as locusts tend to do, as we know? Or do we want to be seen as the stewards of this planet, the stewards of this planet who saved it, nurtured it for our children, our grandchildren, and indeed, for all humanity. Thank you.